Hello people, I'm Eddie Page, you all know me, been watching the videos we've been making. I think this is going to be the most revealing video yet. I've had many, many, many questions asked, what was it like inside the craft when I was retrieved during Vietnam? Uh, I want to thank Ross for the lovely chat we had today. I want to give a shout out to uh, Cosmic Gypsy, Doris, uh, David. Uh, There's so many. I just want to thank everybody for your support and being here. Today I'm going to share what took place in the 11 days that I was missing. The Marine Corps couldn't find out because I actually 1975 when the Marine Corps wanted to try to see if they found evidence to court-martial me for dereliction of duty, unbecoming of a Marine Corps officer. They found no, nothing, nothing. It wouldn't be until 1984, I've been in the agency almost two years, and my close, close late friend, Giles Hamilton, the first regression he did with me concerned what happened with them missing 11 days. I want to start before I start revealing this to you. Um, there was a few things out there. If people know that in 1994 I talked to the International UFO Congress and Alien Tattletale put up a thing that's been out there on the internet for a number of years that um, myself and Katie and a bunch of us was going up to North Vietnam to assassinate the North, Korea, or North Vietnamese Premier. Uh, that was a cover story. It was sub subjectively placed in my mind to go out and say this is what happened without revealing. Well, now I don't have these, uh, these cover things to reveal for them. I'm going to reveal it for me. Uh, back in, I think it was 96, I think it was 96, me and a close colleague of mine named Myron Olson uh, went to the Ozark uh, UFO conference. And I'm not going to mention the gentleman's name, but uh, I just happened to run into him in, in one of the restaurants there at the casino. And uh, we sat down and had a nice little talk. And we'll just know him as T.W. And I asked him, I says, uh, I've read stuff about your experience uh, in 1975. Uh, were they little gray aliens? And he was kind of nervous. He kept looking around, and he didn't talk like we're talking now. He kind of whispered. He was kind of like, no, no. And I said, well, T.W., what do they look like? They, they wasn't like that in the movie they were portrayed. He says, no, they look just like us. I said, really? He says, yeah. I said, was you afraid? He would look around. Nobody's listening. No. No, I wasn't afraid. I felt very comfortable with these people. And he went on and went on, and it's describing things inside that he witnessed firsthand. And then I asked him, I says, well, did they do any medical experiences on you, T.W.? He says, no, no, they never did nothing like that. I says, wow. And I looked at him and square in the eye, and I says, why are we whispering? <laughs> You see, the shock culture of this event, whoever experiences, yeah, it's a little shocking. Those who don't know what, I spent almost 12 years in the United States Marine Corps, but my first duty station was in Da Nang. I've told about the incident on the morning of the uh, 14th, 1973, uh, retrieving a company of Marines who were under heavy attack. Most of you know that my helicopter got shot out from under me. And my co-pilot, my best friend at the time, was K.D. Williams. And um, K.D. lost his life that morning. And I don't remember much of nothing that happened except until 1984 when it was revealed under regression by Giles Hamilton. Um, I took out a bunch of enemy soldiers, and then I ran, and I ran, and I ran. And... Uh, I remember, as I've told you people, that I came to a stream, and it was definitely quiet. And that stream, I was thirsty, I was sweating, God, I was down on all four, and I was drinking the water out of this little stream just like if I was an animal. I had became an animal. I was being me. 
and most of you know who I am. And then I ran and ran and ran more until I couldn't run no more. And I found a tree that had been hollowed out and I got into that tree and I sat there and I started thinking things as a child, as a young boy growing up. It was just like my life was flashing before my eyes and I felt a sting and I looked down and my right heel, all my boot was gone and the sticky stuff I felt was blood. And that was the last I would remember for a long time until 1984. But what I do remember was a bright light, a very intense light. No heat off of it, I just felt it. And then when I came to my consciousness, I remember I was in like what looked like a, an aquarium, a vat, and I was floating in this liquid. It was a liquid that was kind of a greenish teal yellow, and it gave off a, a kind of a fluorescent light. How many days I had been un under, I don't know. Even the regression did not reveal that. But I did re remember this was my consciousness. And under my consciousness, as I was seeing things, and I'm floating in this vat, I remember my head was stabilized. And there was two, like, orbs, hollowed out orbs right around my head, like this. And there was one behind my head. I could sense them, I could feel them, but I was looking to my left and I saw three individuals standing there. Couldn't make them out, don't know who they were, but I felt at peace. Didn't know what had happened to me. I could not tell you what day it was, my name, I couldn't tell you nothing, but I was at peace. These three individuals were standing there looking at me. And off of this other side, and you got to remember, there were seven individuals that I counted. Off to my right side, by down by my feet, as I'm floating in this liquid, there was another being standing there. Couldn't make it out. And as I load, rode my eyes a little bit more, there was a taller uh, being standing here. And I felt compassion from this being. It was just something I sensed. Was my senses intact? I couldn't tell you. I just know that whatever was going on was peaceful. And then there was two beings standing next to me right here. I perceived them as female. I saw the hair was kind of long again. I couldn't make out facial features because of the liquid. I could breathe in this liquid. It was semi-warm. It was refreshing upon my body, and again, I was breathing, just as if I was a goldfish in a little bowl. But suddenly, I re reflected my eyes back to the big Ben standing right here, and he took his hand, his right hand, and placed it on the side of this tank, this vat. And as he did that, I took my right hand and I raised it up and I stuck it to his and we were like this. The only thing separating us was the glass. I assume it was glass. And I felt an energy and I felt a surge of compassion come through that hand that I was touching. Who was this being? I didn't know at the time. But I've seen this being before. And as he took his hand away, and he kept it there for maybe 10 to 15 seconds, one of the females off to my right here took her hand and stuck it in one of the orbs that was next to my head. And I could feel a warmth coming from her hand. And it was a vibrating warmth. I mean, I shook. And when I say shook, I mean, I didn't, you know, but I shook from inside and it was beautiful. I didn't want it to leave, but it lasted for about 10 seconds. And then she moved her hand and that would be the last I would remember. I would remember. For the next several hours, I would assume when I woke up, I was in a small room. I had no clothes on, 
And it was very, it wasn't cold, cold, but it was cold. And suddenly this female being walked in, a beautiful young lady, walked in and brought me like a golden type blanket and laid it over me. And she spoke to me in our dialect. And she told me that my father would be here soon. Was there anything I wanted at the time? Was I thirsty? And I just nodded. And it wasn't long she did, she left the room, the little cubicle, and came back and had a small glass. And there was a orange type liquid. It wasn't Tang, I'll tell you that. But I drank it. And as I drank it, I felt, I felt strength coming back in me. It wasn't long after she left, this man walked in. He was dressed in a bluish type robe and he had a beard and he was fairly tall. And he looked at me and I looked at him and it wasn't a sense that I knew who this being was. It was a sense that I had seen this being before and he was looking at me with compassion and eyes that said one thing my son what have you done I could feel this I tasted it I almost was enveloped with it and he sat down next to the little I guess like a mat it was raised up off the ground and I was sitting up and he spoke to me in a dialect that I had always heard. I couldn't remember where I'd heard this, but it wasn't English. And he said, my son, what have you done to yourself? And I told him, I said, father, I was in a battle. He says, I know, and you almost lost your life over it. Why would you do this? And I couldn't give him an answer. I couldn't give him an answer. He says, I want you to rest. I will be back to see you soon. Rest. So, again, I don't know what day it is. It could have been day five, could have been day six, could have been the tenth day. I really don't know. But he got up and he looked at me and he had a little smile on his face and he left. I don't know, again, the time does not measure where I'm from. We don't measure time, but it seemed like only a moment passed. And my sister Victoria walked in, and she looked at me and she says, you have went and really done something worthy this time, brother. And I says, who is the man that came in? She says, don't you know, that's our father. I went, oh my God, for real. She looked at me and smiled, the only way Victoria can smile. And she says, yes, he's a little ashamed of you, but he's proud of you. And she says, here, I have brought you something to drink and something to eat. This time, the, the, the little cup, and it was clear, had something very dark in it. And I drank it, and it was, oh, it was so nourishing. And the, the, the meal looked like a sandwich, but it wasn't a sandwich. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but that's the only way I can describe it. And I ate it, and God, it was better than anything I think I could ever remember at the moment of ever eating. But the food just, boom, it gave me so much energy. I was ready to get up and walk, but she wouldn't let me. She says, get rest now. Father will be back soon to see you. So I laid down. I closed my eyes and I was warm under this gold blanket. When I awoke, I again, we don't comprehend time as most people do. There was some clothes there. And I, put, I got up and I realized I need to get dressed. So I got dressed. I was in a white, a white outfit. It was like white pajamas and a white pullover. But what was so unique, when I pulled over the pullover and pulled it down, the top of the bottoms connected automatically. 
it made it one piece. And I felt, I felt somewhat strong. And it wasn't long my father walked in. He says, son, are you feeling like a walk? And I said, you're my father. He says, yes, let's go. Let's see things and talk. We walked out of the cubel and walked down this hall. And as I'm walking down this hall, there's other people walking around and they would nod their head and they would smile at me and smile at my father, acknowledging these people were dressed in blue, they were dressed in white, they were dressed in gray, or they were dressed in a teal color. Same outfit I was wearing. And as I walked, I realized this ain't no building. I said, Father, what is this? He says, we've brought you to one of our crafts. When I was notified that they had retrieved you, you was hurt. I came here as fast as I could. He says, I am appalled at what you've done. I said, Father, I, I was helping man. He says, you was helping man do a military cause. You have taken human life. And I felt bad. I really felt bad. And I said, Father, I was doing what I was trained to do. He says, and you did your job thoroughly. He says, as I am told, you eliminated many human lives. It is not who you are. It's not what we are. You've went against everything we stand for. We cherish life. We value life. I didn't know what to say. What can you say? I'm a murderer. I'm a terrible son. But he showed no facets of that toward me. He was just upset that I had volunteered my God-given talents to man. And the only thing I could say, I said, Father, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. And he says, I understand, though. He says, I cannot hold it against you, for this is who you are. It's what you was created to be. And I didn't understand what he meant by that. As we walked, I noticed this magnificent vessel. And I said, Father, what is this? Are we at another world? He says, no, this is one of our crafts. You have been brought here. We are a long, long way from your, your world, where you have, was born, where you returned. I didn't understand that at the moment, but maybe I did. Because there was times as growing up, as most of you I've told, I didn't feel like I belonged here, but I was here. So why the reason I was here, I was going to f complete it to the T. We came to this one section of the ship, and there was this humongous window, like mirror, beautiful. And I looked through this mirror, and I saw a valleys, and I saw like a, a, a stream running, and trees, and it looked like a sky. And there was people out there walking, people sitting in the grass. There was animals grazing. I saw wild animals that back on earth would devour a human, but they were mingling with the people. And I said, Father, what is this? He said, this is our place where we come to meditate. We come to visit with others who are headed home or others who are going back to earth. And I said, wow, and we're in space? Don't ask me why I said that. He said, yes, son. We're a long way from Earth. And I re him to call me son, it was better than that meal that my sister Victoria brought me. I felt energy. Every time he called me son, I felt stronger. And I felt my strength growing immensely. We walked, and people again greeted us, always with a head nod or a smile to acknowledge we were there. And he says, come, son, let's walk back now. You need some rest. And we walked and we walked. I couldn't tell you how far we walked, but this place was immense. I never got to see the control tower, never got to see the propulsion units. It's not why I was there. What was going on when I was being healed? I would find out from my sister. So when I got back, my sister said, 
I'm going to bring you something to eat. You need nourishment. And as she was gone for a short time, she came back, and there was another lady with her who was one of my own, and they fed me, and they sat down with me. And she says, you were almost perished. That's exactly what she said. You almost perished. We brought you here because your system was crying out for help. And we knew exactly who it was. We had known you was there. You wasn't supposed to be there, but you was. And we retrieved you and brought you here because you was so badly injured and wounded that we had to replace a lot of your body parts with new ones. Wow, I'm listening to this. I mean, is this a dream? Am I really dead and just don't know it yet? Or am I experiencing something that I've always known about? And she said, my sister, we replaced your internal organs because they were defective. They were hurt beyond repair. So once we did that, we also massaged your your cranial scopes. That's what she called it, cranial scopes, talking about my brain and my third eye, my God gene. And we're reprogramming it. And a lot of the vibrations, did you feel the vibrations? I said, yes. She says, that's us giving you light, our own life's force our source of our own very life that we are transferring to you. You didn't get it all, but you got part of it. So you would reboost, reboost back to life again. The medical tank that I was in, she called it a vat, the source of all life, the universal life, was known as liquid light submerging me in there so my body would not reject new organs. Did I have a blood transfer? She told me that they replaced my blood with the blood that I came to earth with. It was under their medical understandings of how to bring the dead back to life. 